you guys so much for everybody that came out and uh, just worked on our marriages. That was just really, really enriching to be together, right? Um, and to make this week even better, uh, this man got baptized on Wednesday. We got a picture up there. Yeah! Where's he at? Hey, Stu! Stu, does that look like you? Yeah, that's you! Yeah, that's you! Stuart Spradling's your brother in Christ, clearly. Anyway. Oh, man. That's a chiseled individual. Um, Stu and Emily, they're amazing people. So, just, bro, just blessed to have you as a friend, man. Seriously, I think we all are. If you haven't yet, make sure you show him some love to, for his faith, amen? So, uh, last week we talked about how we should give our all, similar to, you know, the decision Stu made to give his all to God, right? And uh, why do we do that? Because God, God gave us his all first. God doesn't expect us to give anything that he hasn't already given first. And the thing that's special about God is he loves to give his all. That's just his thing. I appreciate Shannon's communion. And uh, you know, he wasn't begrudging about the cross. He's like, man, no, that's, that's, that's for my friend. That's for my little brother. This needs to happen. I can't wait to take his spot. This can be painful. But I, I need to do this and I want to to do this. This is my thing. This is what I was, in one sense, created to do. So that's always been the heart of God, to love, to love with his all. And, um, you know, this week, uh, Valentine's Day is coming up, right? And uh, it's always a special time for me personally, because um, on Valentine's Day, eight years ago now, I asked Melissa to marry me. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. God was good to me that morning. Somehow God said, hey, you need to say yes to this guy. So that's us at Stevens Lake. I think you can see Robin in the background with a camcorder recording everything. Uh, we, yeah, we, we're not very, you know, I don't know. Not Hallmark material, right? We just kind of made it happen. Um, but man, I felt like I had to give my all for this day. I had to pull out all the stops. Right, as you can see, I tried to get as pretty as I could. I had a fresh haircut that morning. Um, I got my black leather jacket on. And, uh, look, I look like Michael Jackson from Thriller, you know? Like, it's like, I was like, oh, I got I to channel my Michael Jackson. And you know, it's a red jacket, but that was the best I had. And um, I had some Jordans on that day, I'm pretty sure. I was like, oh, man, God, I got I to gotta get right. I got to be ready. Yeah. got to give my best. At the time, that was, you know, the best I could dress. It was a leather jacket and some Jordans, you know? I'm like, let's do it. It's the best I got. I throw some cologne on. Not Axe. Some actual cologne. You know? Everybody's like, praise God, bro. You, you, you clearly got input that week about your life. And uh, I ordered these uh, Russian Matryoshka dolls. You guys, if you've been to Russia, they have the dolls that go, you know, they go bigger to smaller. And... And they were penguins. So they were Matryoshka dolls that were penguins. And uh, these penguins now, actually, uh, the, uh, Archer East loves these penguins. He scatters them all over my house. Uh, whenever he comes over, I'm like, I'm like, hi, the penguins, babe. Archer's coming. Because, yeah, they have sentimental value. Where's Tyler at? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's your kid. And uh, he knows. Tyler knows. He's like, yeah, get the penguins, Archer. Son, find those penguins and scatter them all over the place. So Janice can go on his hands and knees and find them. But, uh, you know, so long story short, why did I get these, <laughs> these penguin dolls? Uh, Melissa and I, a lot of you guys know, we fell in love in Russia on a mission trip. And uh, we see the Matryoshka dolls all over the place. And so I'm like, ah, that'd be cool to get one of those. And we both like penguins. So I was like, well, seems like the best of both worlds. Seems like a funny way to show her I love her. Um, so when I proposed to Melissa, I said, hey, you know, uh, here's this val right before this happened. Hey, look, this is a Valentine's Day gift, right? This doll. And uh, I, I, you know, obviously I, my heart's beating a million miles an hour. So I, I really forgot a lot of things that happened that moment. Um, but the plan in my head, how it was supposed to go was she would take out one doll after another until she finally would see the ring, which was wrapped around the smallest doll. And, uh, you know, and, and thankfully that happened. It worked out that way. I, I assume she opened all the dolls and it got there because I forgot everything that happened. Uh, and from there, the rest is history. She is still married to me. Praise Jesus. 
And you know, like I said, I, I had to put on my best. I had to give that. I feel like I gave my all. I gave my whole heart to this. Best plan, best outfit, best thinking. Uh, Vince had to call Melissa's job at the time. You remember? I remember she was a, a graduate assistant at Stevens College, and Vince was like, "Hey, I know she's gonna be in a meeting, but can you like lie to her and tell her we have an emergency staff meeting and all this, that, and the third to get her out of her meeting?" And it was just this elaborate lie that we concocted. And I think she saw through it. She's like, "What is going on?" But you know, Amen. She still said yes. Praise God. <laughs> it was the best I could come up with, right? I gave my heart. Here's the thing. All that being said, I was still nervous. I was nervous. I was like, okay, we've done all these things. But my heart was still beating, you know? And, and clearly, because you're, you're, you're putting your heart out there. Will you marry me? Will you spend your life with me? At this point, I had, I had significant reasons to believe that she would say yes. But, you know, it's still like, ah, ah. She could say no. I could botch the, the speech I've rehearsed. I could say, I could, a lot of dumb things could happen between now and then, right? But I think the heart of God is, man, it's similar. I will just give my best. I will give my heart to you guys. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 8. When we put all of our heart into anything, we risk getting hurt. You risk getting embarrassed. We risk a lot of things. But despite the risk, we also put ourselves in a position to experience a joy, a love, a happiness, a fulfillment that we never could feel if we kept our hearts confined in a box. We just kept it on the box. Of course, it'd be safe, but we wouldn't experience the kind of love that God wants us to feel. Amen. So as we explore, explore our church's 2020 theme of, of entrusted, right? We've been entrusted with something. I think the most important thing that God has entrusted us with is his own heart. The way he puts himself out there. The way you, th you think we put ourselves out there. God can relate to that. God knows what that feels. And it's important because God is relational. We feel most vulnerable ourselves when we entrust others with our own hearts, right? It's like, oh, that's my heart and a platter to you. Hey, be careful. And you know what? Let me just take that back real quick. I need to pray a little bit more before I give this to you. Just unfettered, unguarded. Let me just give me a second. It's tough, right? And as we'll study out this month, however, God himself put himself in vulnerable places. All because he wanted to be close to us and to walk with us. So in this month where we, we celebrate love, right, Valentine's Day, we'll, we'll take time to remember God's love, God's heart. And uh, we'll have a little series here in February called All His Heart. God gives us all his heart and how he's entrusted us with that very thing. And today is all his heart. God cares. God cares. Sometimes it may feel like he doesn't, but God cares. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. You guys there? It says, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. We'll just stop right there. First point is, how does God care? To, to care is to call higher. To care is to call higher. What strikes me here is that God led his people intentionally, without mistake, into the wilderness. Like, God, oh, was that on accident? No, 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 no. That's exactly where I wanted to take them. Into the wild. But not only did he intentionally lead them into the wilderness, what does it say? He intentionally kept them there, not for one year, not for two years, not a decade, 40 years. To the untrained eye, you'd be like, God don't care. Are you serious? Moses died out there. How uncompassionate can this God be? This would seem the opposite of a God who gives all his heart, right? 
You might say, this God's heartless. 40 years to the untrained eye. If you were in the, guaranteed, if we were in the middle of that desert ourselves, year 18, we'd be like, man, we just, I don't know about God right now. I'm just, I'm, I'm parched. But when we keep reading this passage, we see that leading them to the wilderness was actually training them to be a humble people. You read Deuteronomy. That's what Deuteronomy is all about. Guys, remember those years in the desert where God was actually molding us. Because he knew that, man, God's good. He was going to get us to this promised land. But when, he, when we got there, he wanted to make sure that we would take care of it and we would use it for the benefit of the nations around us. When you get there, don't be selfish with the promised land. When you get there, spread your resources. Love other people. We know God cared about them because he cared more about their character than their comfort. I think as a culture, we have grown way too comfortable with being comfortable. We just like, you know, it's like we, we, we just love it. We just crave comfort. Everything about us as a society if we can take the road of least resistance, 10 times out of 10, at this point, I think, in American culture, we will take it. But the Bible tells us that part of God's very nature is to call us higher. It's to get us outside of those zones of comfort. And we got to put ourselves in God's shoes by, by him doing this. Isn't this the path that takes more trust on the part of God? Yeah. You think about relationally. Isn't this the path that takes more faith in us on his part? The man, if I challenge that man or woman, they won't run away. They might. But I care more about their soul than their satisfaction. Here's the thing. If God just coddled us all the time, of course, it'd be easy to follow Jesus. Like, yeah, yeah, I follow Jesus, man. Like, I, yeah, it's easy. But God said, you know what? Over the long haul, that won't be good for them. Me coddling them every time, it's not going to teach them about what life really is. It's not going to teach them what, how things are outside of the Garden of Eden, which, by the way, is our decision. We did that to ourselves. So God's like, y'all made this choice. I got to help you guys out. And live this out while y'all are here. So they may not like me for this. But I have to do what's best for my kids. My kids may hate me. They may resent me. But I got to do what's best for them. Let's keep reading this passage. Because it kind of shows us why. Verse 3 says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Your clothes did not wear out, and your feet did not swell during these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. This is a matter of God disciplining his kids. This was a matter of God calling his children to a higher place in their character. If God is anything else, he is a character coach. He cares about our character. Here's the thing. When we start dealing with character, things get a little dicey relationally, right? We know that having the honest conversation about what we see someone else can change. That's always easier said than done, right? Putting our true heart out there, and especially when it's a heart of genuine concern and love, you may feel that, but it's still tough to put yourself out there, right? Like, oh, this is how I vulnerably and actually and in full reality feel about where you're at right now, brother. But even that can sometimes be like, ah, let me just draw my heart back. Because I, I, I don't want to risk it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to risk the awkward moment. Ugh. 
Who likes being awkward? It's, it's uncomfortable to be awkward, so let me just stay in my nice, comfortable zone. Because Lord knows we can't deal with awkwardness. Here's the thing. God is calling us higher to places he knows that we would never dare go to on our own. He's like, only I can take you there. So I will call you out. He calls us out when he knows we're out of line or we're out of hand. Even though he knows that if we don't like his discipline, we all can decide to walk out of our relationship with him. That's risky. It's like, man, they may not like me anymore. <laughs> right? John 6, right? John, Jesus talks to the 12. He's like, you don't want to leave too, do you? Because everybody else just left. Because I started being real about who I actually am. Everybody else left. Hey, 12, y'all want to leave too? Peter's like, where, where else are we going to go? <laughs> where, where would I go, Jesus? No. I mean, I, I kind of want to, but No. <laughs> That, that's what, those are the kind of interactions that God is after with us and that he wants us to have with each other. Amen. In one sense, even though God, you know, God is outside of time, right? In one sense. But he's always been willing to risk us liking him for the sake of actually truly following him. There are go, there's going to be moments in our lives that make us question God circumstances, right? God, why are you leading me into this wilderness, this desert? The test for us in these moments is, will we see these times as God caring enough to call us higher? To call us to a place of trust that we've never been to before. We say, man, he's, he's trying to change me and I can work with that. Well, we see those moments as God just not being content with being liked by us, but God is actually willing to risk it all and guide us and mold us like an actual parent should. God says, you might hate me for putting you through this, but if it's, it is worth it for me to help you live with me for eternity, I will count this cost. I will sacrifice this moment of discomfort for an eternity with you. Think about this, guys. We were worth it to God that he would endure 40 years of the desert with us. Of us grumbling, complaining about manna that miraculously would appear every morning. Like, literally, every morning was a miracle. And they were like, I hate this stuff. Yeah, it's a miracle. Pah! Can't stand this miracle. This is, tastes bad. God's like, this is a miracle. It's a miracle. What are you talking about? What do you need from me? What do you want? He's like, you know what? I'll keep working with you because I love you. And I will keep molding your character. I will keep pounding on your heart. We were worth it to God that he endured years of grumbling from a people he rescued from slavery in Egypt. Like That, that should be enough. But it, it, it's so, it, to me, I'm grateful for God. We were worth it to God that he couldn't let us just be weak-willed and spoiled brats for our entire existence. God says, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to give you my whole heart. What you do with it is up to you because I love you. If we want to love each other the way God loves us, we must also be willing to call each other higher. That's us being like God, right? We got to care more about our characters than being liked. I think for so many of us here, we valued the process of becoming a Christian because it was the first time someone was actually gut real honest with us about who we were, but they weren't trying to tear us down. They were trying to build us up in the process. And it was refreshing. It was like, oh, praise God. Someone actually truly loves me for who I am. I just told this guy all my dirt, and he ain't, he, ain't, he ain't looking at me like I'm some kind of fool right now. He actually wants to help me not be a fool. They cared about our soul. They cared about the people we could become. That's from God, guys. God sends us those people. People who are willing to risk 
not being liked by us for the sake of trying to help us be like Jesus. And we spent some time with the Davises yesterday after marriage class. And, uh, you know, we, we did some hang time. It was great. It's been too far too long. These guys do so much for our teen ministry. They're amazing. Uh, man, it's a long time. We got to spend some time with you guys, man. And, you know, we, 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 point, we point out some things that we saw in their lives that I was concerned about. And I appreciate them because they looked me dead in the eye and said, man, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for paying attention to our family. Made me think, man, that's the heart I always want to and need to have. When someone shares something direct like that, like, man, thanks. Because I wouldn't get this anywhere else. I wouldn't get this anywhere. Thank you. I was inspired by that. Where when people call me higher, I'm grateful. Let a righteous man strike me. It is oil on my head, according to the psalmist, right? That I always take that conversation as God himself, through the Holy Spirit, speaking through one of his disciples, to call me to another level in my faith. God's family calls each other higher. Here's the thing, right? We already talked about this. It's challenging to be honest. Challenging to be real sometimes. Maybe for most of us. Some of y'all are like, I don't care. I'll let you have it, you know? <laughs> But I would say for most of us, it's like, mm, it's tough, right? Sometimes to call someone else higher calls us higher. And that's good for us. That exposes something in who we are. A little people pleasing, right? You get that feeling in your stomach like, man, bro, I saw that. Now I got to be honest with you. Ugh, why did you do that? Why did you do that, bro? Now you're making it awkward for me. Ugh. Now I got to say something to you. Oh, Jesus, why? You know, it's tough. How do we get to the place where, like, okay, Lord, ah, how do we get there? Let's reread verse two. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. Second point that helps us get there is to care is to be a companion. We're companions with people. I think we'll be able to call one another higher. We talked about this in the marriage class yesterday. The Hebrew word for to know, and a lot of us know this, who've done the ministry and training program here. It's a word called yada, Y-A-D-A, which means to experience. To the Hebrews, you couldn't know something. You couldn't know anything just by reading it out of a scroll, the way we think today, we, if we read it out of a textbook or a tablet, right? We think, oh, that's knowledge. You know all this stuff. You can, you can put all the right things on a Scantron. You know things. But you were like, that don't mean you know squat. Just get that Scantron out of my face. Like, that doesn't mean you know anything. To know something meant you actually had lived it out. If you were to tell someone, hey, I know you, but you haven't actually lived life with them, They've been like, you don't know me from a hill of beans, man. You haven't been through anything with me. You haven't been through the struggle with me. How would you know? The Hebrews, that's why they were a very tribal and community-focused people. Because that's what knowledge was to them. Experience. Life. So it, it goes without saying, Christianity, if you ain't living it with other people, that ain't Christianity. You can't lone wolf Christianity. You can't be out here, one, one man squad, one man army. That does not, God's like, no. That, if there was a one man army, it was Jesus. And even he had 12 people with him all the time. Even the one man army himself was like, I, I just want an army because I think they're funny. You know, whatever. Yeah. I think it's important for us to remember that that is the level of closeness that God wants us to experience because you know what because it's real it's not fake we're not here because we want something fake right you know last week we talked we looked at the garden of eden and how we as mankind used our free will to choose sin and in essence we said i want to separate myself from god but even though we want to separate ourselves from god with our actions god his heart is still, is still saying hey don't leave don't do that. 
I know you messed up, but I want to get through this together. I, we can do this. Let me hold your hand through this desert. I know this desert for some of you is not even your fault. Maybe you're being affected by your parents' sin or the sin of someone else around you. And I'm heartbroken about that. But just know that I'm here. And I want to go through this with you. That is the heart of God. That he's a companion. He's a best friend. He wants to be close. Even though we give him plenty of reasons to not want to be close with us, he still wants to be close. When we, lo we, when we lost our, our first daughter in Springfield, I felt like God was still with me and Melissa because the brothers and sisters there were our companions. That's what it felt like, man. It's like we were playing harmonica, you know? <laughs> we were like, man, we just sound poor. <laughs> Life's real right now, man. <laughs> See, timing was perfect. That's what those days felt like. It's, well, it's, life's tough right now, you know? Someone play the harmonicas. Get us through this. I'll never forget, you know, we, we spent some time here, actually, after everything happened, and we stayed at the Job's, and I went to Twin Lakes, and where I got baptized, and I prayed there, prayed my heart out. I was like, God, I got to figure this out with you, man. Hung out with the Hawkins, but then after a week, we went back home. And, uh, you know, where we knew our daughter's crib was still up and the room was still decorated and uh, knowing we'd eventually have to take all that down. And uh, we had a service not long after that. Right. And uh, right after service, because, you know, we still have church. And uh, after service, some of the disciples there, they know me too well. They took us out for some barbecue and wings, some soul food. Right. And um, actual soul food would have been great, too. But amen. Food is food. It was just good. I was like, man, guys, thank you, man. You know, thank you. And as we were there, we started talking. There's nothing really you know, in the agenda. We're just talking. And before you know it, we're all tearing up, crying <laughs> at the barbecue place in public together. It was the Shavers and the Lovelaces. Some of you guys know them. And Matt and Andrew's kids were there. And they were going through it with us. And it was just family time at the barbecue place. <laughs> yeah. At 12, you know, 1 p.m. in the afternoon on a Sunday. We're just raining outside. We're just like, this is tough. To care. Here's the thing. They didn't need to have any answers. They were, they were actually, God spoke through Ken and, and Matt. And I know they did. But to care is to be just companions. Through the good, the bad, and the ugly. It, it is to cry in public, not out of some act, but because you are actually going through it with your friend. Like, you're in it with them. And it's, you don't have to rehearse it. You're just there. You feel it. Because they're your people. You are now experiencing in many ways what your friend is experiencing because you have linked yourself so closely. Your heart is with their heart. I know that logically, Ken and Shelly, man, and Andrea, they weren't going through what we were going through. But man, I sure felt like they were. And I felt the hand of God because of that. We see God through people, right? First John, it's all over the book of First John. That's how we see God. It's through one another. I saw God through my companions, through my family. I saw it in Jeremy and Cheryl when they said, hey, our house is your house. You know, just, just use it for whatever you need. I'll never forget reading Job in their living room, you know, and coming across that scripture. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. I'm reading that like, whoa, I never... Thought that was in the Bible. Man, but I needed that place. I needed Jeremy and Cheryl. But hey, this, our home is your home. Just, just be there. My friends gave me that. My friends still give me that. Family, how are we doing with experiencing the highs and lows, the good, the bad, the ugly together? Brothers and sisters, when we see each other go through a hard time or, or struggling in sin, do we pursue just spending time and being family through that time. Hey, brother, hey, hey, man, I heard, I saw, I heard what you're going to do. Man, just come over, man. I, I'll feed you. We don't got to talk unless you want to talk. Let's just come over. It's a two-way street, however. Do we pursue being open and asking for help through those times? 
you know, disclaimer here, Melissa and I made it clear after we spent some time to ourselves, we made it clear we needed people at church. We made it very like, and we weren't like, oh my gosh, what was us? We, 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 we were vocal and honest about how much hurt we were. In. <laughs> Do we make it clear with our brothers and sisters that we need each other? Amen. Do we tell people, man, I need you, bro. Sis, I need you. Sometimes that, even saying that just feels kind of like, Ugh. I don't need anybody. Wait, I do. Sorry, I need you. <laughs> but we've been trained our whole life. We don't need anybody. We're, we're independent, self-made Americans. We don't need anybody. It's tough. And I'm all about gritting through things and pushing through things. I love that. I love that about how God gives us that spirit, that forehead of flint, right? But God, Jesus himself was like, man, I need you guys. I need you to pray, man. It's getting real. Can you pray with me? Why are you sleeping? This is Jesus we're talking about. The strongest man ever. He was like, man, I need you to pray. You're killing me right now. Do we make that clear with one another? Amen. How are we doing with making it clear that we just want to be there for each other during the highs and the lows? Or do we make it clear that we don't think we need each other? What are we making clear right now? Guys, I want to challenge us. Let's express our need through texts, phone calls, dinners and lunches together, prayer walks together, passing out on couches together while we watch something, and everything in between. Amen? To care is to be a companion. And the last point is to care is to be curious. It's interesting after, you know, let's read verse three again. It says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And as you know, it's verse two, I'm sorry. It says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not, you would keep his commands. God said, hey, I, I'm curious. I want to know <laughs> what's in your heart. I think it goes without saying, God knows everything, right? God's all knowing. He's all present. God knew everything about Adam and Eve in the garden. And he knew what they were doing. He knew what was going on. And yet when he's strolling through the garden, no pressure, just hanging out. He knew what was happening. He knew what, ha what went down between them and the serpent, right? Yet I appreciate God. At, guys, where are you? He was just like, hey, get out of here. I believe you guys. Unbelievable. Get out. Hey, you better get out of here. I don't know. God wants so much. He wants something so much deeper than that. Hey, guys, where are you? Where's your heart? What's going on between us right now? What's happening right now? I feel weird. Do you feel weird? Maybe it's just me. What's happening right now? Because this is not us. This is not the play. I don't know. Maybe it's me. <laughs> but what is happening right now, guys? That's who God is. God cares immensely. And he's curious. Though, and here's the thing. Though he is aware of our hearts, he wants to make sure we are aware of our own. That's why he will ask the question. That's why he will put us in circumstances to teach us, to show us things about ourselves. God knows our character, but if it means putting us through a few things to help us search ourselves, he's okay with that. If it means putting a few people in our life to say a hard thing or two, he will do that. Because He's curious about how we will respond, and he's curious about our hearts. You know, the opposite of curiosity is one of them is being judgmental. You know, you see something, right? You're just like, oh, you're one of those people. All right, well, I will not be talking to you anytime soon. And when I do, it'll be very surfacy. How you doing, bro? See you later. Just like that. Because I saw something in that person. 
I'll be honest with you, I don't want to go any deeper. So I'm staying right here in my pocket. That's judgmentalism. No curiosity, no desire, but hey, so where are we at right now? What's happening right now? What's going on? No desire for that. The other you know, opposite of this is to be assuming, to make assumptions. How often do we assume the worst in one another? How often do we just assume in general? How often do we assume the good and the bad? I think it's good to assume the best in people, but how often does that even prevent us from just even expressing the good we see in the person? The, the positive things we see in that person. Oh, that person's doing great. It might be good for us. I, I really admire that person. It might be good to share that with that person at some point. Because I don't know who you know, but we, we get affected by negativity all the time. So instead of keeping the...